I just want to do God's will. What you're seeking is a blessing from God. You must expect a miracle. You have the power of choice. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Life Today Live. I'm Randy Robinson. Good to have you guys watching this today. And this is going to be uh, a tough, a tough one to to watch in some ways. I think perhaps the worst thing uh, ever is the abuse of a child. You know, um, it's uh, I think the the average normal non psychotic person would agree. Yeah, abusing a child is is wrong, and it's not just wrong; it's just evil. You know. Unfortunately, today's guest faced such abuse, but she has spent a lot of time uh, regaining her voice, uh, taking the power back that that man stole from her in many ways, and really just healing. And it's a long journey, and and you're going to hear that journey today. Uh, And so I appreciate you being here. You can hit share, like, follow, subscribe, wherever you're watching, whatever you can hit. Uh, And that would be great. Cindy Aravalo is is my guest, and she has a book out. Uh, It's called Living in Silence. And we'll we'll talk about that aspect of it because that is obviously, uh, it's just part of the prison that that evil puts people in is, is that silence. But she is no longer living in silence, and I respect her for that because that's not easy uh and she is speaking out so you get to hear her. cindy thank you for taking the time to to share your story with our audience today on life today live thank you so much for having me on today randy thank you for the intro also <laughs> um I, I just take us back to to wherever you want to start um you know i've, I've read uh you know the notes that you're that uh, the publisher provides. I've read some of the news stories uh, about your abuser, Um, but take us back to where you want to start and kind of walk us through so we can understand what you've been through and what we're facing in our society. Yes, definitely. Well, I want to go back to when I was 14. At the time, I was somebody who was very shy, very insecure, very naive, didn't have a lot of experience with life and definitely I I felt like I was behind the curveball when it came to boys. I had never had my first boyfriend at the time, never kissed a boy yet. And I always felt very sheltered in a sense of, I know my parents were doing it to protect me. But at the same time, I felt that if they would have been able to tell me, you know, if somebody ever says this to you or does something to you, please say something because that's not, that's not right. It's not normal. And a lot of times I think that, they unfortunately didn't have the right tools to to teach me or to guide me in that aspect or in that sense. Hmm. And I remember when I met my abuser, I was 14, I was in middle school. He was a substitute teacher at the time. And then he got hired as a permanent PE teacher. And I started building a relationship with him where he started telling me how pretty I was, telling me that I was mature for my age that I was smart, that I was beautiful, that I, I, in other words, he was seeing me. I felt seen and I felt heard. He was really good at listening to me, really good at talking to me, really good at being a friend and being there for me, if that makes sense. And that was something that I didn't have at home. My parents worked long hours just to make ends meet. So I hardly had the time to speak with them. And then when I did, they were just so exhausted from work that they didn't want to really even have a conversation with me Mm. because they were just too tired from working. And I always felt lonely. And the person that I could turn to was my abuser, was Kip Arnold, who I felt comfortable with, who I thought I can talk to him about anything and he'd be there for me because that's exactly how he made me feel. He made me feel that he would be there for me for anything. Our, can, can I ask a yeah. question here? Because I, I'm, was any of that, you think, I mean, genuine or was he grooming the entire time? I believe he was grooming me the entire time. Mm-hmm. Looking back now, I can see that it wasn't the first time that he had done something like that. Mm-hmm. And he was very comfortable the way he approached our conversations, the way that I felt even manipulated by him by not being able to 
speak freely about it to anybody, to any of my friends, because he used to tell me, if you tell somebody you're going to get in trouble and I'm going to get in trouble and you wouldn't want that for anybody. Right. And I would say, of course not, because to me, that was the only true friend that I really had outside of my peers at school. I felt like I could really confide in him and not just that, but in a sense, he was almost a father figure to me because my dad was home, but he was not home. If that makes sense. He was always working always mentally checked out, stressed out about bills. And this man was there for me. Mm. Someone on online watching right now is saying this, this same thing happened to me. You mentioned, um, one thing I didn't see in the news stories is, is th- were there others that came forward besides you? Um, I don't, I, I would say I did have another friend come forward um, for, privacy purposes, I can't disclose their names, but because of her, I had the courage to come forward and tell my story. Okay. Yeah. And and if if anybody hears one thing, if you're in that situation, have the courage, let Cindy give you that courage today. Uh, What, 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 you know, what transpired from there? You start with a friendship that you think is a friendship, but obviously is not. Where did it go from there? From there, it led to a crush. So then here's this man who's paying attention to me, who sees me for who I am, who I think genuinely cares about me. And I start developing a crush for him. And sure enough, he tells me that he also has a crush on me. And at the time, I'm an eighth grader and I'm in middle school. I'm 14 years old. But he tells me, I can talk to you on the phone, but you can't tell anybody. You can't tell anybody that I like you. You can't tell anybody that you like me because we're both going to get in trouble and we wouldn't want that. So I understood that from the beginning. My sister actually overheard a conversation of ours right before I hung up the phone and she actually heard his voice. She didn't hear the full conversation, but she heard the end enough to hear his voice. She confronted me and asked me, who was that? And I said, oh, it was a friend. She said, that is not a boy. That is a man. And I said, no, it's a boy. And she's like, no, that is a man. So she told my mother and the way she approached it, instead of having a talk with me directly saying, you know, um, something isn't right. Who is this? Please talk to me. It was more of an accusation Mm -hmm. in the form of, could you believe her? She's talking to a man, how disgusting. And my mom, of course, didn't have the right tools. So it's like a form of punishment in a sense of, I can't believe you. You're disgracing the family. And no, you're not allowed to talk to him. But I don't have an explanation as to why. What's wrong with it? And that's the end. So my sister calls him and she threatens him, telling him, if you ever call the house again, I'm going to report you to the police and stay away from my sister. So my sister felt content with that. My mother felt content with how she addressed it. And that's how it stayed. But the twist here was that later on that night, my mother asked me, so who is this man? And of course, I have the biggest crush on him at the time. So I'm gushing over him. I'm like, he's a great man. He's a great teacher. He genuinely cares about me. He helps me with my homework. And she's like, oh, okay, a teacher. And what is he? I said, he's a white man. And she's like, oh, okay, white. And then where does he live? I'm like, he lives in a boat. And she's like, oh, okay, a boat. So he must make money, right? I'm like, I don't know. You know, at 14, I'm I'm not concerned about anybody's income. Then she's like, okay. Um, She's like, well, I give you permission to speak to him on the phone. But just don't tell your dad. Don't tell your sister. And who knows? Maybe later on, it might turn into something romantic. And she gave me an example of a friend of hers from El Salvador who met a bus driver who was much older than her and she got married with him. So she's like, who knows that might be the same case for you. And by her giving me permission, it was his green light. He, he felt very accessible to me where he said, okay, if mom's aware of me and she's okay with me talking to, to you, then in other words, he yeah. felt just yeah. free. Yeah. Yeah. How, how old was he at the time? Do you know approximately? He must have been in his mid 40s at the time. He used to tell me he was 37, and then I caught on when every year was 37. <laughs> I'm like, no, how really? 
how old are you really? Um, he didn't really want to tell me, but I assumed he was in his mid forties. So uh, you're, I, I don't, I don't want to sound, sound cruel, but was your, was your mother naive or was she not given all the facts? I mean, I, I it baffles me that a mother of a 14, 15 year old would, would encourage a relationship with a PE teacher in his forties. Yes, I do believe my mother was naive. Um, she didn't have the greatest childhood growing up. She actually had a very hard, harsh childhood growing up. And she was, she, she didn't have many tools in her life. She didn't have somebody pouring into her, telling her that she was loved. She was actually orphaned for some time. Mm. And it was just a very hard upbringing that she had. And mm. I do talk about it in the book. So there's more details about yeah. it in the book as well. Yeah, yeah. But I, she didn't know about the abuse. As time went on, she had no idea that he was okay. abusing me. Okay. Uh, now, I, I, I want to be delicate here. Um, but what, what, how do you phrase it when you, when you discuss the abuse and what that entailed? It was... Horrendous. So uh, outside of sexual abuse and trauma, I can say it was also verbal abuse. It was blackmailing. It was gaslighting. Mm. It was manipulation. And of course, it was rape and it was sexual abuse. Oh, my God. Uh, how long and did that go on and how did it end? From the time that I was 14 up until I was 19. Oh my. So how it actually ended was I'm now in a junior city college. I'm 19 and I happened to get pregnant by my then boyfriend who is now my husband. And he is furious. He is upset. He tells me, you need to get an abortion. I said, no. He said, yes, you do. You need to get an abortion. And he's planning a meeting for me to get an abortion. He wants to set up a date wow. to get me an abortion. And I said, no. So he's really pushing now from, cause I go a lot into details in the book. He went from blackmailing me with money to now pushing an abortion, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. And I remember clearly that I made a decision within me that I was not going to let him do that. He had already done so much harm in my life, done, so many evil things to me that I thought, no, how, how can he have a say to an unborn child? And he used to tell me, please do yourself a favor and do that child a favor and don't bring it into this world because what are you going to provide for it? And what is your husband, well, my, my husband now going to provide for it? And he's like, no, just please do it a favor. And I ran away from home. I didn't tell my parents that I was pregnant yet. I didn't feel safe coming forward to them either to let them know I'm pregnant. And I left with my husband's family and we were living there for, for a bit, for some time. And I broke my phone. I didn't hear from him anymore. But the crazy thing is that when I came forward during our sting operations, he tells me, I never stopped looking for you. And that disturbed me oh, to my wow. core. And he wanted to know information about the baby. So he actually mentally kept track of my pregnancy. And he told me the baby must be this old. And sure enough, he was right. He said, I never forgot about you. I'm here for you. And he wanted to creep back into my life. Yeah. that Well, creep is the right word. Uh, um, you said sting operation. How did, t Tell me about that. Okay. So I'm coming forward. I say my story multiple times. Of course, I don't have any evidence of what I'm saying. It's just the story that I'm saying. And the detective tells me, you know what, Cindy, I believe you, but I'm so sorry. We don't have any evidence. Mm. He's like, the only way we can get some evidence is if you talk to him. And that was the last thing I wanted to do. I'm like, no, I don't want to see him. I don't want to hear him. Sure. They're like, that's the only way. So they said, we're going to give you a phone. We're going to guide you on what to say. We're going to record everything. We're here with you. I thought, okay, then I feel safer that way. So sure enough, I get on the phone with him. I start talking to him about our fondest moments in life. And right away he catches on and he says, I think that you're with the police, aren't you? You're turning me in, aren't you? And I'm like, no, why would you say that? And he's like, well, why are you bringing this up now? 
I said, if I would have turned you in, don't you think I would have done it sooner? And he would think about it like, okay, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. And then he started getting more and more comfortable opening up about certain things in the past and then certain things about my current future at the time. And it didn't take long for him to just feel that he was being eaten up inside. So on one of the last thing operations that I had with him, he tells me, begging me, please, I'm begging you. If you did turn me in, I need to know because I can't go to prison. I would rather die than to go to prison. I feel like my past demons have caught up to me. And my daughter can't know about this. There's no way. I can't live. I can't live like this. Like, please tell me. And the detectives and the officers actually ran into him at a gas station in the city of Lakewood because they were already on to him. They were watching him. He hadn't been home in some time. He wasn't comfortable going to his house. It's like he, he already knew I'm being watched. Yeah. And they went on a, pro, a police pursuit, which led to two pit maneuvers. And he got away on both. And there's a helicopter following him. And he probably sees no way out. So he decides to jump off the freeway. He lands on a tree. And he's such a big man that they couldn't just open the door and get him out. They had to just open up the whole roof of the car and airlift him out. And I see this on the news as it's happening. And you just see him cover his face. He's so embarrassed. But yet he's saying, I'm not guilty. Wow. Wow. Uh, now, wow, there's so much there. I, I, it's weird because on the one hand, I, I see a man who is deeply troubled and deeply tormented. Uh, and it, it just points to the whole fallen nature of of people in in a way that just screams for salvation i'm curious where was where was god in this whole thread for you what were you raised in a a christian family at all was this did you have any awareness of god what's going on on that front so i was actually raised catholic and my mother and my sister uh, um went to a Christian church, they gave their life to Christ, and they started taking me along with them to church. I remember from being seven years old up until 14, 16, we would go to church, but I always felt forced to go to church. It wasn't really a personal decision. Um, Same with my baptism. I felt forced to be baptized. And I ran away from God for the longest time because I didn't feel worthy. I didn't feel like a good person. I felt ashamed, embarrassed. I had a lot of guilt that I was carrying around, guilt that should have never been mine to begin with. And I remember that when I would even go to church, I didn't want to be there. I felt so uncomfortable because I felt unworthy to be there. I knew who God was, but I didn't have a relationship with him, if that makes sense. And I, I, I was afraid to, because I thought, how could someone like him look at somebody like me and forgive me and accept me and love me. And that's what I ran away from for the longest time. I actually gave my life to Christ in September of 2019. I got baptized Mm. in February of 2020. Mm. And to me, that was the most beautiful thing ever. It was my freedom. It was my peace, my everlasting peace. Because for years, I struggled with anxiety, with depression, with suicidal thoughts, with just so much baggage. And I went to therapy, and it helped me so much. But it only took me so far. And finding Christ and giving him everything, all the ugliness, all the the trauma, the, the depression, the anxiety, just everything and leaving it at his feet and not taking it back. That was my freedom. Mm. That was my salvation. That was my peace. That now I can talk about what happened to me with so much peace and confidence. And some people look at me, we're like, how can you even forgive him? How can you talk about this now and not break down in tears? And it's because I feel that peace of the Lord in me. I feel his courage. I feel his grace, his love over me. When I ran away from him for so long, And the day that I met him and accepted him, he met me with the opposite. He met me with his love, with his grace. He met me with everything that I thought was the opposite. Mm -hmm. And he hugged me. He held me. 
He accepted me as I was, and he worked, and he still works tremendously in me to this day. I I can tell I can tell that that's genuine, and, and I can tell that you got beyond a religious environment, uh, which can, in some, uh, make you feel unworthy because we all are, in a sense. But what you're saying is exactly the nature of Christ. The you know we know we all know John three sixteen. You know God loved the world; He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him will have everlasting life. John three seventeen, right there. God didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come here to condemn us, but so that we might be saved. And that condemnation that you felt was coming if you got in God's presence, it's beautiful because you found just the opposite. You found the salvation and the love and the acceptance. And now you would, we talk about this idea of holiness, which really um, there's, there's, it's wholeness. Uh, and, and it hasn't been that long. I mean, we're talking a couple of years now um, since your baptism, at least, um, are, are you, are you walking out that daily walk towards wholeness? Uh, meaning just pointing yourself in the right direction. Cause we can't really do it ourselves other than just say, Lord, I'm going to trust you and let you do it. But are you, are you feeling a sense of wholeness come maybe to you for the first time? Yes, I do. I honestly, every day I ask him, excuse my dog in the background. <laughs> I ask him to let it be his will that be done, not mine, but his will. So even on interviews like today, I get on my knees, I pray, I ask him to use me as his vessel that we're able to share his testimony. I call it his testimony because I look back now and where I thought I was lonely, I was empty as he was still there in control. He led me with the right people. He led me with my attorney, with the detectives, with my friend who helped me come forward, with my husband who has been my support and my rock that helped me get out of my situation, with my first daughter who he sent, and I call her my angel because of her. It was what got me out of leaving him for good. And, of course, the therapist and the friend that prayed over me to to accept Christ and it's like it's like he already he he was in control then and he's still in control now he had a plan then he has a plan now and I pray that he used this our testimony to be of something that will reach and impact thousands upon thousands of people that are currently still hurting that are living in silence and depression guilt anxiety and to let them know that they are not alone yeah. especially with God by their side. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, honestly, if, if you can just help one, that will be tremendous. Uh, you yes. Know, so, okay, I have a, a couple of questions regarding um, the, your abuser because I read some articles on his sentencing and things like that. But uh, I want to show people the book, again, Living in Silence, because some of you need to get this. It'll help you. Uh, it'll help you a lot. Um, it's available wherever you get books. Uh Someone online, though, has a quick question, and I will honor that. She's asking, how long, how many years did you sort of run from God? I can honestly say from, to my awareness, from 14 up until I was 28. Okay, wow. Um, Contrast. Uh, you kind of have already, but uh, I'm just curious. Contrast how you feel on a daily basis now that you've stopped running and you've let God love you um, with with how you felt during those 14 years. I have peace, yeah. complete peace. I feel free. I don't feel binded to him anymore, attached to him, attached to that trauma anymore. I just feel free, if that makes sense. And don't get me wrong. Sometimes there are some hard days. We're all human at the end of the day, but now I know I take it to the Lord. Yeah. I won't run from him anymore. It's it's right there in scripture. It's for freedom. (laughs) And then Christ came, you know, and, and I love it. I absolutely love it. God bless you. I, I, so I did read that, um, and you name him and I, and I think it's fair when you read the news articles, uh, from, from LA, uh, you, you read about Kip Arnold, uh, and then you read about, you know, the, the unknown victims. Well, here you are saying, yeah, I'm one of those, which is kind of kind of scary and kind of big, but I think it's really, it's powerful. 
I'm curious though because if the news accounts I read were accurate, he was sentenced to four years in jail for his crimes, which to me seems really low. Yes, he did. He was sentenced for four years, and with good behavior, he got out in two and a half. Okay. Uh, Everybody watching right now is a little bit freaking out, I think, (laughs) you know. Uh, We hear about California's lenient sentencing at times. How do... How do you respond to that? Because I know, I mean, I'm, I'm not you, and I'm kind of angry about that. How do you feel? Yes, I personally think that it's unfair because it's not even the time frame of his abuse towards me. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I do leave it in God's hands. He obviously got out a couple of years ago already. He does have to register as a sex offender for life. He can't ever work in another school again. And... <laughs> You know what? I I do wish him the best. I genuinely do. And, you know, it might seem crazy to some people, but I don't know. It it took a lot for me to realize it actually through a movie. I don't know if you've seen the movie The Shack. Mm -hmm. When I saw that movie, I felt like a ton of bricks hit me because there's a scene there where it seems like the father has to be the judge toward two of his children. And he has to save one and condemn the other one to hell Mm. but they're both his children and he can't bring himself to do that so he says take me which to me that was what jesus christ did for us did for the world to save us so at the end of the day i thought you know what i've been a pretty good judge i've been telling god please forgive me but no don't forgive him because you know what he's done (laughs) so don't forgive that one and I've been a good judge at that. And I thought it's about time that I let that go. And I give that to the father because at the end of the day, he is his creation. And I do hope that he finds Christ, that he gets redeemed, that he turns away from his sins and starts living a new life. That attitude, that response can only come from God because, um, I, you know, and it, it's, it's human nature. Uh, you just you go okay that that's not justice i got reason to be angry but you're right do we trust god's justice or man's justice or our own justice and at the end of the day you got to realize my justice is short uh, and it's imperfect and certainly the law has demonstrated that <laughs> that it's imperfect as well and so yeah i mean to to say i i trust god's judgment that's a sign of maturity spiritual maturity um and i'm they say that forgiveness is really for the forgiver, not so much the one who committed, you know, uh, the offense. It's it's one thing to say all these things; uh, it's another thing for you to live it. Uh, I'm just, I mean, I sense a sense of peace on your end and and resolution and let it go. I mean, is that part of the freedom too? The forgiveness and the trusting God for the justice rather than carrying that sense of injustice around yourself? Was that a part of your freedom? Yes, definitely. And more than anything, it's the courage and the peace that the Lord gives me because Mm. I know on my own, it's like, no, I can't. And I say it because I've done this many times in the past where I said, okay, I forgive them. But then I would get all angry again. (laughs) And he thought, no, that's not fair. That's not right. And now that I, I gave it to the Lord, left it to him, didn't take it back. I have the Lord's peace Mm. and the Lord's courage, the Lord's, the Lord's strength to do that. Mm. The Lord's mercy to do that, because I know out of my own flesh, I would just be like, no, I can't. I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and (laughs) uh, last thing before we kind of wrap it up with your parents, because, um, you know, I, I get it working hard, trying to provide for the family some, a lot of naivety. You, we all assume that this happens to other people, not to our own children. Um, h- how is that relationship now with, with you and your parents? Now with my parents, I could say that I forgave them too, mm. because for a long time I was very angry and bitter at them because when they did come forward and they did, they were aware of it, they still didn't respond in a positive manner, mm. which was very hurtful because they are my parents. And I also struggled with that for years. And again, it was through Christ that I was able to forgive them and to not hold anything accountable to them. I can now look back and just see that they both had very harsh upbringings. 
They both lived in poverty. They both just struggled a lot in life and they didn't have the adequate tools. They still don't. And I don't hold that against them. Wow. Uh, Cindy, God's doing some huge things in your life and, and in a, in a fairly short amount of time, you know, two, three years is, is that, that's, that's a lot. And so I, 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 I celebrate what God's doing in you. And, and I just pray that he would continue to, to use you in your peace and freedom to extend that to others. Um, what do you, what do you hope? Where do you want, where do you want to see, uh, Cindy Aravalo in five years? I want to see her having an organization or being plugged into an organization to help victims of crime, to help survivors, to lead more people to Christ. That's my priority. It's just to win more more souls to the kingdom, to populate the kingdom. Because at the end of the day, we are all sinners. We are all lost. We are all empty. And the only one that can fill in all those voids is our Lord and Savior. And he's the only one that can save us at the end of the day. So that's my main goal. My main goal is to populate his kingdom, work for his kingdom. Okay. You are, you are on a track for blessing. Yeah. And, and I think that that is beautiful. Thank you so much. Is there, is there anything else you want to mention before I let you go? I know you've got, you're active on social media, let people know about that. Uh, how, if there's a way that they can support you, please, please tell us, but, uh, what, what else do people need to know before I let you go today? Uh, my social media is for Instagram. It's underscore Cindy underscore Aravalo. And you can follow me on Instagram. I do have the link to my books there also. So you can click on the link and it'll take you directly to Amazon. My books are sold on Amazon. I also have an audio book, which is sold on Audible. You type in Living in Silence by Cindy Aravalo and it'll come right back up. But more than anything, I would like to say that if you are a survivor yourself, you are not alone. You didn't bring this upon yourself. You weren't asking for it. You weren't dressed too provocatively. Mm. You weren't doing anything to bring the abuse onto you. And that abuse is not something that you should carry. It is not your burden to carry alone. I pray that you leave that to Christ, that you surrender it all to him. If you haven't given your life to Christ, I pray that you receive him, that you let him into your heart that you let him make a new creation in you. And if you have received Christ in your life and maybe just kind of distance yourself, I pray that you recommit your life to Christ, that you accept him in your heart again, that you seek him, that you worship him, that you read your Bible daily, that you just talk to him daily. More than anything, build that relationship with him like a good friend, have him close to you. Because at the end of the day, whatever you're going through in life, whether you're a survivor or not, he is the only one that can get you through life. That is so powerful. I, I, Cindy, God, I just, I love what God's doing in you and the fact that you're surrendered to him. I, I, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Randy. If this has touched you, and especially if you are involved in a ministry or women's shelter or anything related to that, I would encourage you to, to go buy a bunch of Cindy's books it will help support her and give them away because it will help the people that need to hear it. Uh, and if you don't have the money for that, I bet you know someone who does. And and just take that step and say, hey, would you would you buy 20 of these books so I can give them away, you know, at this place and, and help people? Just just go out there and do it, and, and it'll help all the way around. Just my idea for the day. I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, hit share, hit like, subscribe or follow if you haven't. Uh, and support what Cindy's doing. And we'll come, we'll see you again next time here on Life Today Live. If we have providence, guide us it is God mercy. The same for you, the same for every man, you and Gentile and Mohammed, whether they believe it or not. We float on this vast, limitless sea of divine mercy.